Hello folks, this is Seishu, your host at Tiffincast, and today we are joined by Elizabeth Christ at the National Geographic. Elizabeth is the senior photo editor at the magazine, and I'd like to welcome her to, the, to our audience here. Uh, Elizabeth, thanks so much for making the time to speak with us today. Um, sure. I'm I, ho I hope you're having a great day. <laughs> so far. Let's hope that doesn't change in the next uh, 15 minutes. <laughs> All right. Good. Um, I, you know, I think, what, what, you know, one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask you right off the bat, of course, is uh, on most people's minds, how do I get published uh, in the National Geographic uh, magazine? And most people would say, well, you got to work, you know, your tail off, you got to have great images. But is there a way, perhaps, uh, uh, is there is there a network that one should belong to, perhaps? I would just say that because we invest so much time and resources in every story, that we have to be very prudent, you know, very careful in who we work with. Sure. And so most of the people we work with are people that we've seen sort of coming up, you know, in different uh, arenas mm -hmm. and people whose work we've seen in other publications, but also at photo festivals, mm -hmm. you know, things like um, uh, Visa pour l'image in mm -hmm. uh, Perpignan and uh, Look 3 and World Press, you know, places like that, different competitions. Um, people who've built up a really solid record of storytelling in long form journalism, you know, um, in depth narratives. Um, we're not interested so much in single images um, because we're really looking at uh, in depth storytelling. So we're looking for people who've had a chance to, you know, immerse themselves in their own projects, you know, to show that they can be um, dedicated to something over the long term. Do most of you, most of the photographers who are vying to be a part of the magazine come from uh, a newspaper background? Do they have years of experience as a newspaper photographer who've actually worked on those long projects for newspapers and then you, you, you notice them at these festivals? I would say that many of the photographers who are working for us now have had newspaper experience, especially people who are older. I'd say a lot of the younger people um, that that's changing and they don't have as much newspaper experience. And that a lot of the younger people, um, if they have too, they also bring multimedia skills ah. and that they're really adept at audio and video too. Wonderful. So that's probably changed in the last 10 or 15 years, right? Definitely. Right. Definitely. Photographers uh, are no longer expected to just to bring in great images, but they're also bringing in audio and also video. But I have to say that we really leave it up to the photographer. No photographer is forced mm -hmm. to actually have to gather those kinds of assets. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to say that a lot of the newer people we're working with, that's definitely a bonus, you know, if they can bring that to us. But, you know, some of the people, especially people who've been working for us uh, for a long time, it's really up to them. You know, many of them are excited. They really want to learn. They're investing their own time mm -hmm. into learning those kinds of skills. And that's great. We love it. And we're happy to have them sort of experiment on stories with us. But on the other hand, um, you know, they don't have to if they don't want to. And some people sort of react against it and, you know, are shooting tin type or, you know, large format film. And that's fine, too. You know, whatever mm -hmm. best tells the story. Let's shift gears just a bit because, um, you know, I my background is in, in photojournalism and I, I was a photo editor at ESPN for five years. Mm -hmm. um, and... I'm very intrigued by what you do for the magazine. Uh, I know I've read a little bit about uh, what photo editors do, and uh, so I saw your uh, webinar with uh, uh, Photo Shelter explaining the process of, you know, how you go through choosing images and what you're looking for and what what different, uh, you know, what do, what other sort of avenues people can submit pictures for, but when it comes to editing images, why is it important, first of all, to work with an editor? I guess I feel strongly that most photographers, if they're 
producing any kind of volume of work that it's really helpful that, for them to have any kind of secondary eye. And I think that, you know, we can help give them perspective. They're so immersed in the experience of what it was like to have shot those uh, images that they're not necessarily thinking about the kind of impact that the uh, pictures will actually have on a you know, casual viewer, you know, somebody who's coming to the images in a new way. And I also think that you know, we can help them understand sort of how best to present the work, you know, which images deserve to have more of a focus, which images you know, they might want to leave out where, where the redundancies are, you know, which images just don't have the same kind of emotional impact. I think there's a lot that um, an editor can bring. Um, I think that we can help them think about, you know, how do they tailor the work to a particular use, you know, if they have a specific outlet in mind, or we can help them think about, you know, where the work can mean something to somebody, you know, where can they show it, where can they, um, where is it best suited, you know, to be seen. Right, right. Um, to, to that effect, I mean, would you recommend every photographer have a working relationship with a photo editor, whether, regardless of their, their genre of photography? I don't know that I would make that a universal rule. I'm sure that there would be exceptions. But I think it couldn't hurt in most cases. I think that, you know, what is key is finding the right person, you know, finding someone who really respects uh, your vision. You know, because basically the editor is there to sort of maximize, you know, the impact and the, um, the meaning of the pictures. And so whatever I can do to help the photographer look his or her best, you know, mm -hmm. that's really what I'm interested in doing. Um, really just in fulfilling their vision more than anything else. Wonderful. Uh, the way we got introduced was through Photo Shelter. Uh, sure. I, I know you have uh, a workshop coming up uh, through Photo Visura mm -hmm. that uh, I think, believe it's in, in July, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, right? Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's toward the end of July. End of July. Uh, tell us a little bit about that workshop and what one could possibly learn from attending that workshop. Well, first of all, it's a really wonderful experience because you're in a really beautiful part of Vermont. So you're spending, you know, four or five days with uh, um, a bunch of really nice people, usually in uh, Vermont. And um, the people who run it, uh, Adriana uh, Teresa and Graham Latourney, are really wonderful. And they just have a particular uh, inspiration, you know, to sort of bring together editors and photographers to help, you know, both to help editors find new photographers, but also, you know, primarily to help the photographers understand mm -hmm. more about their own work, you know, and how best um, they can create their own sort of persona, you know, visually. So I think it's a really, a really wonderful experience. And so what I would do is, um, work with the it's a first of all it's very intimate there are only two photographers with one editor and there are a whole series oh, of editors wow. terrific editors um, by the way um, and what they do is they will have everyone sort of staying um, in the same uh, really again really lovely condo you know in Vermont and um, you sort of feel like you're on vacation and you're looking at the work together and in my case, I would also be able to speak to some of my experiences I've had at National Geographic. But again, the primary focus is really to look at the work of the two photographers. And there are not only sort of group sessions where we talk about, uh, you know, just photography in general and other outlets and different websites, you know, where you can um, look at some of the best photography, but also really a lot of individual sessions where I would spend time with each photographer separately to look at his or her work and to sort of analyze what I think is the strength of it, you know, and, uh, you know, basically try to counsel them on, you know, what they can do to improve their shooting, how we can edit the project into its strongest form, you know, where it might actually uh, be able to find a home somewhere, you know, where other people can mm -hmm. see it. Or, you know, if they just want it for their own personal uses, that's fine too. It's really, you know, whatever the photographer feels the need for. And so I'm there to work with them and help them, you know, just figure out 
how they feel about their own work and um, and what they might do to improve upon it or to complete the project, fill in any holes, um, and to look for places where you know it might make sense for the work to appear. So there is a uh, quite a bit of follow up uh, after the workshop, I imagine, or is there? That really depends on the photographer. Okay. Um, and. I have to say that um, Adriana and uh, Graham are really terrific about follow-up, and they really stay in touch with a lot of the people. Um, and I know part of the workshop also is Graham giving, um, should I put it, sort of a coaching session on the uh, photographer's online presence, and so he's cool. able to advise about websites and uh, you know other sort of media, you know, um, ways that they can reach um, an audience. So it sounds like such a terrific opportunity for photographers who want to grow in their in their craft. And I feel like if I was if I was here, not in India at that time, I would have signed up for sure. <laughs> I mean, really, I would have. Um, um, I, I I mean, you've put it. I think it's great, but you know, I'll, I'll also say, you know, every person has to look at that. Um, look at the website and sort of get a sense of whether it would be right for them because sure. some people are not comfortable in such an intimate session. Some people might want something which is more of a classroom, more of a long-term experience. You know, this is just a very intense experience, mm -hmm. which I think can really help change people's ideas. Um, but it is just, you know, three or four days. Um, and it's very in-depth and very intense. It's very one-on-one -on -one, um, as well as you know, four or five of us together. Also, um, it's it's also, it also does have a little bit of a vacation component. I have to say, it's not one of those uh, experiences where you're up all night. You know, like some of the workshops oh, okay. that you're you know frantically trying to meet deadlines. It's very relaxed. Um, I mean, both Audrey and Graham are fantastic cooks. You know, they're constantly spoiling you with great food, and um, it's just beautiful there. You know, you can walk in the woods. You can photograph there. It's so, but it. But, you know, people should check it out and make sure that it's something that they feel is worth it to them. Sure, sure, definitely. Um, if I can return to uh, the magazine again, mm -hmm. um, clearly everyone has a, a smartphone these days. And, um, you know, there are photographers who are working for newspapers who are also using their smartphones, mm -hmm. making images, uh, you know, uh, whether it's Iraq or whether it's uh, you know North Dakota, it doesn't matter. They're, they're using their iPhones or, or their smartphones uh, to make images. Are you, is the magazine uh, open to accepting images made by these other devices uh, other than a traditional DSLR? Well, first I have to say that I saw a demo yesterday by some of the Google people on Google Glasses, and pretty soon you're going to be able to take a picture just by <laughs> winking. Winking, right. Winking. It's really amazing. So right. Um, you're right, it's becoming more and more a part of daily life. And um, before I forget, I also want to recommend that everyone look at Instagram if they get a chance, sure. if you have a uh, you know, phone, you just download the app. But um, the Nat Geo uh, Instagram feed, I think, is fascinating. Just to be able to see what people can do with their smartphones is incredible. Mm -hmm. But I would say at the moment, other than one or two unusual sort of sidebar features to some of our um, primary stories, we haven't run uh, phone pictures. You know, we had um, one feature on. Um, it was young men in the Middle East or something that uh, one of our photographers shot with his smartphone. But that was really more to showcase that kind of media, you know, than anything else. Mm -hmm. And um, otherwise, as I said, we're really open to anything, but that wouldn't be our first choice just because unless it's part of the story, okay. um, it you know, the quality just wouldn't be comparable, you know, but, you know, it could make sense for some stories, you know, if there are stories sure. about those kinds of subjects, then sure, why not? Um, right. But, you know, as I said, we're open, like, I, I was serious when I said that about Tintype, we actually published yeah. a story that Rob Kendrick shot right. on Tintype, you know, um, a few years ago, because, again, it was um, suited to the story, and he just did something recently on extinct species, and it sort of made perfect sense, you know? Sure, sure. Um, uh, oh, also, before I forget, sure. I that anyone should look into submitting 
photographs uh, for your shot. We have a whole um, department, which we run both in print and on the web and on iPad, um, where we run our viewer, our audience, our reader uh, photographs. And um, that's a great venue, actually. Um, we have a uh, editor Gene Moderman who runs that and to if and people can submit also for visions uh, professionals can submit to our visions uh, section which is a series of three double truck pictures that run in the front of the magazine it's fantastic exposure and uh, Sherry Rookbacher runs that and so you know there are ways if you look in the magazine you can see how to submit for those and anyone can submit and I really encourage people to do that lovely lovely I'll be sure to mention it in the blog post that will that'll go underneath the this video um, back to the back to the uh, workshop in Vermont uh, which sounds so awesome by the way uh, I as a photographer uh, who may be transitioning to other things, uh, one of them may be wanting to be a photo editor. Do you know if resources like the workshop you've just you've just signed up to to be a part of that will cater to somebody looking to move from being a photographer to being a photo editor? You know, I would just say that because the workshops are so intimate, we can tailor it to anybody coming in. Um, because, you know, that could also be interesting for the other photographer, too, you know, since there are two photographers. But, um, you know, I'd say, why not? You know, if someone wanted to find out more about that and about, there's so many different paths you can take to becoming a photo editor. Mm -hmm. And I guess I believe that about photography, too. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess the most important thing is just to just keep looking, looking, looking. You know, it's sort of endlessly looking, both, you know, in museums and galleries and online and, you know, in print. I mean, whatever you can right. do to see more photography and different kinds of photography. You know, sure. don't get locked into sort of one universe of photography. Gotcha. Now, I know you, you mentioned uh, at one point in the webinar with uh, Photo Shelter that uh, your background actually is English. At, from English, Prince, literature, yeah. English literature from Princeton University, is that right? That's right. Yeah. So I'm just trying to figure out how did you move from reading books to reading images in a way? I mean, <laughs> is there a jump that you made at some point and go, wow, I got it. I know how to do this. You know, I always loved photography, and I just accidentally sort of stumbled into a summer job right after I graduated um, in the Princeton area that had to do with assisting an uh, educational company in making visuals. I was helping uh, do some stock research and I was helping the photographer set up shoots and with the casting and so it was totally accidental and I still wasn't really intending to go into it but then I ended up getting a job with the Asia Society mm -hmm. and um, as of you know in a, the capacity of a photo editor and I just found that I just loved it and again it was more just from spending a lot of time looking at different publications and um, in magazines and museums that I really began to realize that I could actually make a career out of it. You know? Sure, sure. So, um, so I don't feel like people have to study in school. I think that sometimes the benefits of going, say, to graduate school in photojournalism is not only that you're so immersed in it and that you learn so much from your teachers and your peers about the kind of norms of what the business is about and how to best function in this business and also you know of course refining your own vision your own way of seeing but also it's the context that you make and it makes a lot of shortcuts for you mm -hmm. but I think you know as I said about workshops you know sometimes it's not the right person for every t you know the right procedure the right you know, environment for every temperament that um, every person has to decide for themselves because some people learn just much better on their own and just by doing and by getting assignments. You know? Yeah, wonderful. Um, one last question. I, I, I uh -huh. emailed you a picture that I just shot a couple of days ago and I was wondering <laughs> if you might humor me by critiquing it and, and telling me mm -hmm. at what point you think that it, it is a picture or it is not a picture. Um, you know, something that perhaps I would, I would get from you at the workshop in Vermont. You know, if I were to show you a, a set of pictures and this is one of them, uh, mm -hmm. what would you, what would you be able to say about this picture? Well, I'll pull it up now and I'll take a look at it and I'll just tell you that because at National Geographic we always deal with 
of sets of images and series of pictures. Um, I would definitely critique each single image for sure, mm -hmm. but um, I'm also, you know, much more concerned with the whole body of work and sure. sort of how it flows, you know, working together, sort of how it goes from beginning, middle, end, that sort of thing. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and look at this. I'll take a crack at it. As I said to you before, I don't have that much to say about this particular image um, because there's nothing, you know, glaringly wrong with it. Um, there's nothing that I would say would need to change necessarily. Um, I think, you know, what works about it for me is the fact that it has so many different planes, you know, that you, your eye is sort of drawn right to um, the woman's head and the flag initially, and then it keeps on uh, going back into the picture because you have that sort of depth of seeing the background of the town. And so I think it sort of evokes a mood of, you know, sort of small town Americana, uh, you know, a sense of well being that there's sort of this community coming together, you know, for some occasion. So in that sense, I think that it, um, it works. And because, of course, you know, the woman's red jacket, you know, it, sort of echoes off of the flag, which echoes off the flag in the background. And just, you know, sort of how luminous her white hair is. And then you have the white hair of the man ahead of her. It's also sort of glowing in the sun. And normally, of course, you know, when you have that kind of um, midday sun, I would say, you know, that's usually the worst light to shoot in. But it really works here, I think, because it just, you know, everything just shines, kind of. Um, but I would also say it the success of this picture for me really depends on what your purpose was in shooting it. For instance, if you were shooting it for a newspaper or a local publication, which was sort of celebrating community, then I think it's great. You know, or if you're talking about a metro section, um, you know, which is focusing on a specific holiday, then I think it works really well. But on the other hand, you know, I wouldn't necessarily to be brutally honest, you know, put this into a museum, you know, or on a gallery wall. And for me, that's because I don't feel like there's a strong enough emotion that's evoked by it. You know, for me, for something to stand alone as a single image like this, I would really want it to just hit me much harder in the gut, you know, and just have a much stronger impact uh, emotionally or to be more of a surprise or to be something that hadn't been seen before mm -hmm. or to you know to have more of a sense of a revelation of something that I didn't know and this is just too familiar for me you know to warrant that kind of you know exalted sort of attention yeah, but absolutely. it could work well you know as part of a series or you know part of a story I think it would be fine wonderful Elizabeth thank you so much for your time Sure. I, I know I've taken quite a bit of it. Um, if my audience has questions for you, uh, mm -hmm. they will probably ask uh, underneath in the in the comment section of this uh -huh. post. Uh, sure. Would you be open to coming back? At, you know, time of course being uh, a huge consideration. Come back and answer some questions if you're asked it. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I'm happy to do that. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you so much again. And sure. I look forward to meeting you someday I uh, hope so too. in D.C. So um, hopefully we can make that happen. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.